everyone. Thank you. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Kenneth Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is a professor of biology at Brown University where he finished his undergraduate studies. After um, finishing his PhD at um, uh, University of Colorado in 1974. He spent six years teaching at Harvard before returning to Brown University. So uh, during the break, I uh, had the pleasure to learn some nuggets of personal information about Dr. Miller. He uh, lives on a small farm with his wife and his horses. He, lo he loves horseback riding, of course. Uh, he's the father of two daughters, uh, both college graduates. Uh, one is um, a wildlife biologist at uh, uh, Audubon in Massachusetts Audubon Conservatory, and the other one is uh, an um, historian, is a high school historian um, and uh, economic teacher. And um, Dr. Miller uh, did competitive swimming in high school and in college, and he still uh, does master's swimming these days. And uh, he also umpires softball, college softball, and on top of all of these activities, he has time to publish papers and to travel all around the country to give talks. Uh, he is both a passionate Christian and uh, a um, highly accomplished scientist who firmly believe, believes in evolution. He uh, is one of America's experts in evolution and intelligent design. Uh, people call him the public guardian of evolution in America uh, for uh, taking a public stand in stating that neither science and religion nor faith and reason are incompatible. Dr. Miller is famous in the scientific and religious community for his um, debating and utterly demolishing the supporters of uh, the artificial intelligence of the artificial of the intelligence design in the 2005 uh, Dover Dover trial. He uh, played the key role in preventing creationism for, for being taught in high school as a science. And uh, probably uh, many of you have seen the, his two hour long YouTube video who had millions of viewers worldwide. He describes his experiences in his trial in his recent book, Only a Theory, Evolution and the Battle for America's Scientific Soul. His other very popular book, uh, Finding Darwin's God, A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution, stands as evidence that the theory of evolution and the theory of God are not incompatible. Uh, Dr. Miller is not only an accomplished scientist, but also an extraordinary educator. He co-authored five high school, high school and college books that are used by millions of students nationwide. And he has received five major awards for outstanding teaching and uh, numerous professional honors. I cannot think of a more deserving person to receive the Mendel Award today than Dr. Miller. So please um, join me in welcoming um, Dr. Kenneth Miller.
thank you very much. I, I'm overwhelmed by an awful lot of things. I'm overwhelmed by the award. I'm overwhelmed by the introduction, which is very generous. I'm certainly overwhelmed by the crowd. And I want to thank all of you for coming here today. If you're standing in the back, and I, you know, I was a student once too, you might, you know, you might be standing here because you think, man, if this guy is boring, I want to be able to get out of here without making a scene. But if you are willing to hang around, I see a lot actually of empty seats up here. So if you want to come up, please do. It will not be disruptive of anything. Um, Again, I want to thank uh, Villanova, especially for giving me this, this extraordinary honor. Um, and I, um, uh, I'm just humbled, not just by the honor, um, but also by the people who've received it before, uh, many of whose sandals I do not feel worthy to loose, um, to use a biblical expression. Um, the, uh, you never know how you're going to be introduced. So I always like to bring my own introductory slide so I can tell you who I really am if I have to. Um, I'm a cell biologist. I work on biological membrane structure and function. I publish in journals like Cell and the Journal of Cell Biology. And this is a photograph of me in my very messy lab in Providence. Um, I think it's fair to say, and I'm speaking particularly to the college students who are here, that lots of you, and I say this with some trepidation, lots of you probably already know me and you may not like me. And the reason for that, look carefully folks, if you used any of these books when you were in high school. Um, yeah, I was, I, I was afraid of that. Um, I wrote them, and I have to apologize for them. I, it, it, it's a funny thing. Um, uh, my wife and I live in a very small town in Massachusetts called Rehoboth, Massachusetts, so about 8,000 people. And for quite a few years, people in that town knew me, uh, knew who I was, but not because of what I did for a living. For about 10 years, I was kind of like the commissioner of the girls' softball program. And I would, you know, I ran our spaghetti suppers to, to raise money. I trained our umpires. In the summer, I used to coach one of our all-star teams. So they knew me as the softball guy, but they didn't know what I did for a living. And one year, the high school in our town, Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School, adopted one of those textbooks as its standard book for biology. And my name was on the cover, and my picture was inside, my cover was blown, and suddenly everybody knew who I was. Now you might think, you know, it's like a cool thing to have the school in your own town adopt your book, and I guess it is. But about a month into the semester, I'm driving up in front of the high school to pick Tracy, my youngest daughter, up after field hockey practice. And there's a woman there in front of the high school who knows me from softball. It's another coach. Her name is Bonnie Kelly. And Bonnie flags me down and she says, Ken, Ken, you wrote the book that they're using in the high school. And I said, yes. And I got that big, dumb look on my face you get when you think you're about to be complimented. And I puffed out my chest like this. But Bonnie looked me straight in the eyes and she said, funny thing is you don't seem that smart. Um, so I was never, never quite sure how to take that. Um, my wife insisted that it was a compliment, but if you knew Bonnie Kelly, you might not be sure. Um, you might wonder, if I'm a cell biologist, and I do most of my research with the electron microscope, um, how exactly do you get involved in evolution? What's this have to do with anything? Well, the answer is, if at a moment of weakness, you allow a former student of yours to convince you to do something absolutely insane, like write a high school biology textbook, you can get drawn into this. And the reason for that is our books have such a strong treatment of evolution, and they're so widely used, that in many places around the country where evolution becomes an issue, maybe the issue, it's our book that people find objectionable. And just to show the tenor of this, a couple of years ago, a county in Georgia purchased our textbook for the 17 high schools in that county. Bless those good folks. But people on the, in the community and in the school board were so concerned about the treatment of evolution in those books that they insisted that a warning sticker be put on the front of the books, just like a pack of cigarettes. And this is the wording of the warning sticker. This textbook has material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things. This material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully and critically considered. Now, when that sticker went on that book, a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution called me up, and she had asked if she could interview me. I said, yeah, that'd be cool. And she started off the interview by saying, Dr. Miller, aren't you outraged at these warning stickers they put on your textbooks? Now, I've been interviewed before, but I've never had a reporter suggest a word like outraged um, in a response. And I thought, you know what? I think she is 
trolling for a quote, as the expression goes. In other words, she wants to write a story with an inflammatory headline, like author incensed at labeling of book, or um, author, or, or better yet, northern author outraged at the sense of book. Um, but I decided I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction. So I said, no, I like the sticker. She said, you do? I said, oh, I think the stickers are great. They just don't go far enough. And she said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, of course the book has material on evolution. It's a biology book. It has to. Um, then I started to read, evolution is a theory. She said, is evolution a theory? I said, of course it is. Chapter 15 of this book is entitled Darwin's Theory of Evolution. So there's no argument about that. But when you say theory, not a fact, that's misleading. And she said, you better explain that. And I said, let me put it this way. Let's suppose that a young person in Georgia had decided to go to the university to study atomic physics. Now, one of the th to study physics, one of the topics that they'd have to really master is something we still today call atomic theory. Now, why do we call this topic atomic theory? Is it because you know it's just a theory that there are such things as atoms? It's not really a fact? Well, the answer is, of course not. Would you think that at some day in the future, we would change the name of the subject to atomic facts? It doesn't even sound right. The reason is a theory in science is a unifying explanation. And atomic theory is the unifying explanation for hundreds of thousands of observations and experimental facts about the nature of matter. Evolutionary theory is called that because it explains hundreds of thousands of observations and experimental facts about the nature of, 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 of living things. Theories in science never become facts. Theories in science explain facts. But I told her, I'm not really as bothered by that as I am by the third sentence. And she looked at that sentence and said, are you against having an open mind? And I said, no, 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 no. Read that like a 14-year-old. And what that says to a 14-year-old is that we are certain, we're positive of every topic in this book except for one. And that one is evolution, this material, and therefore that's a little shaky. So she said, so you object to that statement as an evolutionist? I said, no, I object to that as a cell biologist. Because you know what it tells that student? You don't need, apparently, an open mind to study my subject, cell biology. You only need that for evolution. You don't have to study carefully to learn biochemistry. Apparently, that's pretty easy. And you don't need, you don't need critical analysis to learn ecology. And I said, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. No charge. I will rewrite the sticker for Cobb County, and I'll give you a good sticker. And she said, how would you word it? And, and here's how I worded it. I would say this textbook has material on science. Science is built around theories, which are strongly supported by factual evidence. Everything in science should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. Alas, they didn't take me up on that generous offer. <laughs> um, they were sued by parents in their district went to court, I actually testified in the trial, and they lost, and all the stickers had to come out. So the stickers, unfortunately, are no longer there. However, a teacher I know in Cobb County actually managed to rescue a sticker for me, and I now have this up in my office as one of my most prized possessions, one of the stickers that used to be in my book. Well, doing this sort of thing basically made me think that I ought to write some things about how people can understand evolution. And that was the basis of a book that I wrote about 10 years ago called Finding Darwin's God, A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. Um, I thought this would be a little book. And what I mean by that is, you know, mom and dad would buy a copy. Maybe I could send one to my brother, Ron, in Kansas City. I say that because his son, my nephew, is here, although I'm not going to point him out and embarrass him. Um, um, and, and they might be impressed with that, but that would be it. To my astonishment, this book is now in its 29th printing in paperback. And what that tells me more than anything else is how hungry people are in the United States to see someone address these issues. Well, a lot has happened since I wrote that book. And last year, I published a new book called Only a Theory, Evolution and the Battle for America's Soul. And a few of the things that I want to talk about today are actually in that book. Now, many of you, especially those of you with a sense of American history, might wonder the following. Didn't the Scopes trial settle all of this you know, like 80 years ago? And, and you might think it did. But um, all of you, I'm sure, have, uh, if you don't know about the Scopes trial in detail, probably figure it was pretty much like that play 
inherit the win, you know, with Spencer Tracy there, and Spencer Tracy sort of taken apart the, uh, the counsel for the other side. Um, and indeed, the actors in Inherit the Wind did bear a very good physical resemblance to Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, who were the principals of the Scopes trial. And what people seem to remember about the Scopes trial is that science was vindicated that uh, the other side was made to look foolish. Well, that might be true, but the reality is that John Scopes was convicted. Um, the Butler Act, under which he was prosecuted in the state of Tennessee, remained on the books for more than 40 years. At the year that I graduated from high school, it was still illegal to teach evolution in six American states. Now, when did that change? It changed beginning in 1965. When the young woman you see here, her name is Susan Epperson. She was a second year biology teacher. She took a new teaching position at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. She submitted her lesson plans. And her department chairman told Susan, you can't spend a week and a half on evolution. Um, Susan then said, you want me to spend more? And the department chair said, no, no, that's not what I meant. You can't teach anything about evolution because it's illegal in the state of Arkansas. We have a law against it. And if you did teach it, the school board might insist that I fire you. Well, Susan thought this was outrageous. So she, you know, she's 25 years old. It's her second year of teaching. She sues the state of Arkansas. Incredibly, she wins, arguing that this act is unconstitutional. The state appeals it to the state Supreme Court. State Supreme Court reverses the decision reinstates the law. She then appeals it to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court unanimously fines for her. This decision, Epperson versus Arkansas, Supreme Court 1967, this is the decision under which all the anti-evolution laws in the United States were rendered invalid. Now, the reason I bring this up is in part, um, a couple years well after this, I was involved in testifying in a federal court case right here in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg. Um, and the day after my testimony ended, I got a ton of email, not all of it complimentary. But one of those emails said, you know, Dr. Miller, I read your book, I liked it. If I mailed it to you, would you autograph it for me? And by the way, I kind of know what you went through because some years ago I was involved in litigation on the theory of evolution too. And I thought, who is this? And I go to the bottom of the email and signed Susan Epperson. And I just, uh, I couldn't believe it. I wrote back to her and I said, Dr. Epperson, she's now an adjunct professor of chemistry at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. I said, Dr. Epperson, you don't have to tell me who you are. You are a rock star as far as I am concerned. And I will autograph my book only under one condition, which is non-negotiable, which is that you must send me an autographed picture of yourself so I can hang that in my office. So two weeks later, I get a nice package. I open it up. There's my book. Put my name on it. Then I open the photograph, and it's not the photograph I expected. And this is the actual photograph she sent me. So here's this very pretty young girl. This is obviously Susan Epperson. She's sitting next to this really old guy. You know, must be 80, 85 years old. And you know, all 85-year-old guys look pretty much the same. So I have no idea. <laughs> I have. Yes, I, I know there are a few people in the audience who would take issue with that. I apologize. It was a cheap joke. Don't worry, I'll go after lawyers later. Um, um, but, you know, I thought, who is this guy? And then I flipped the picture over, and Susan had written on the back. She said, this is a picture of me and John Scopes. And a chill went down my spine. I thought, wow, this is astonishing. John Scopes lived just long enough to see Susan Epperson ultimately vacate, repeal, you, you might say, the law under which he was convicted. So once again, you might think, great, now we have a victory. It's legal to teach evolution in the United States. Well, the answer is it wasn't really a victory. A new strategy emerged in the mid to late 60s after this case took hold. It was called scientific creationism, and it argued for balanced treatment. Two American states, Arkansas and Louisiana, passed laws requiring the teaching of so-called scientific creationism wherever evolution was taught. Um, this led to another court case called McLean versus Board of Education. The uh, people testifying in that case included a very young Stephen Jay Gould and an even younger Francisco Ayala, former Catholic priest and eminent geneticist. And lo and behold, once again, they won the day. This has been the consistent pattern in litigation about evolution. And in this particular case, the Arkansas creationism law was struck down. And later on, a few years later, so was the Louisiana law.
So is that the end of it? Well, not really. The next strategy is to call it something else, and to call it, in this case, intelligent design. And the general idea is if you avoid references to a creator and you emphasize complexity in living things, and there's plenty of complexity there, you can make connections to a designer without naming that designer, and you can imply a kind of creationism. There was a book called Of Pandas and People, which was published explicitly to support high school courses in intelligent design. This is actually the book that was purchased by the Dover, Pennsylvania Board of Education for students to learn about intelli intelligent design in the Dover area high school. Now, what does intelligent design actually mean? Um, I think the best way to explore that is by starting off by saying what it doesn't mean. Um, I would argue that theists, people who believe in a god of any sort, by definition, believe in some sort of transcendent intelligence. And, and you might express that as a view, that there is a kind of meaning or purpose or even an intelligent design to the universe. Now, for what it's worth, that's actually a point of view that I happen to hold myself. But this is not what is meant by intelligent design in the conversations that we have today in the United States. What intelligent design actually is, is today is the proposition that outside intelligent intervention, which is called design, is required to account for the origins of living things. Now this means intelligent design is not this kind of general philosophical consideration of meaning, value, and purpose. It is a doctrine of special creation. Now why do I say that? I say that because if one claims, for example, that the animals of the Cambrian period were designed, or the proteins that clot our blood were designed, you don't just mean they were designed. You mean they were brought into existence by a force acting outside of nature, and that is creation, no matter how you call it. That doesn't mean it's wrong. That simply means that is the proper term for what we're talking about, which is special creation of complex structures and living organisms. Now, many of the advocates of that point of view would argue they don't get a fair shake in the scientific community because the scientific community is closed to new ideas. Well, if that was really true, science wouldn't go very far. Um, we deal with novel scientific claims all the time. What you expect somebody to do when they make such a claim is to back it up with research, usually a lot of research. Um, you then subject that research to peer review. That's a much misunderstood word. It doesn't mean you send one paper to one journal and then you, you whine and complain when it gets rejected. Um, every scientist has a stack of papers and grant proposals that have been rejected. Peer review means you subject yourself to the give and take in the scientific community. You go to meetings. You put your ideas out there. You gather criticism. You react to that criticism. That's what peer review means. And eventually, if nature is on your side, if you really have a useful idea, you will win a scientific consensus that basically suggests your idea is right or it has merit. And then quite automatically, these ideas end up, the novel ideas, end up in classroom and textbook. Now, advocates of this thing called intelligent design say they have a new scientific idea, too. And if they wanted to do all this, I'd say, that's terrific. I'll see at the cell biology meetings. I'll see at the biochemistry meetings. We can argue about this. I'd like to see you answer the criticism. And especially, I'd like to see your new research and all this other sort of stuff. However, the advocates of intelligent design think all of this is too messy. It's not going to work for them. And they prefer a procedure that looks rather like this, <laughs> in which their ideas are injected directly into classroom and textbook by means of the political process. In short, they do whatever they can to actually uh, to avoid the actual scientific process. Now, one case study, one example of a place in which exactly this was done was, of course, Dover, Pennsylvania. And in 2004, using the political levers of power, local school board, an intelligent design policy was voted in, and the science teachers in Dover were asked to prepare a curriculum on intelligent design. This is the Dover High School Science Department. This is a small town. Um, what did they do when they were asked to do this? The answer is they refused. They basically said, this stuff is not science. To become a teacher in Pennsylvania, you have to sign a statement that says, among other things, I will never knowingly present false information to a student. They said, this stuff is false information. You should fire us if we did teach it. Well, as it turns out, the school board didn't fire them, but they did, think about a school board doing this, they did write their own four paragraph lesson on intelligent design. They asked the teachers to read it to the students. They still refused. So then they sent the superintendent and the assistant superintendent into the classroom to read this little lesson to students. 
The next day, 11 parents objecting to this policy filed a First Amendment lawsuit against the board in December 2004. The lawsuit became known as Kitzmiller versus Dover. It takes its name from this unassuming woman over here in the blue blouse. Her name is Tammy Kitzmiller, K-I-T-Z Miller. Um, and this case moved to trial with remarkable speed. In federal court, the judge that you get is pretty much the luck of the draw. The judge that they managed to pick was a fellow named John E. Jones III. They were delighted initially, the intelligent design advocates, because Judge Jones is a lifelong Republican. He's a political protege of former Governor Tom Ridge. He used to head the state's liquor control board in Pennsylvania. Um, in most states, I have to explain in great detail what the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board is. <laughs> My wife actually grew up in western Pennsylvania, and she understood immediately this guy used to head political patronage in Pennsylvania for the Republicans, a big deal. And to become a senator, sorry, to become a federal judge, you not only have to be appointed by the president, but you also have to be approved by one of your state's senators. And the senator who recommended Judge Jones was Rick Santorum, probably one of the most conservative members of the United States Senate. He was appointed by President George W. Bush. This guy is a judicial conservative and a strict constructionist. And in their blogs, the advocates of intelligent design said, great, we got a conservative judge. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get the evolutionists on the stand under oath, and we're going to break them down under cross-examination, and we're going to get them to admit that evolution is just a lie and there's no evidence for it. And what you see here is the NBC TV courtroom sketch of a representative Darwinist, namely me, on the stand <laughs> being cross-examined by the trial. I didn't know about this courtroom sketch at first, but about 11.30 at night, my mother called me up and said, Kenny, you're on TV. Um, I then discovered what my mother is doing at 11.30 at night. She was watching this sort of stuff, and she said, they have a sketch of you there. And by the way, have you really lost that much hair? Um, and all I could tell her was, you know, Mom, you know where I got these jeans from. That would be you, so there it is. But in any event, the trial, which lasted six weeks, did not have the outcome that they had hoped. What actually happened during the trial is intelligent design literally collapsed as anything even remotely resembling a scientific theory. That was really the outcome. Contributing to it was the fact that what I might call the icons of intelligent design, the favorite examples that advocates of ID like to say couldn't possibly have evolved due to their own complexity or a, a property called irreducible complexity, these cases were just blown out of the water. Um, and they included things like the bacterial flagellum, the blood clotting cascade, and the evolution of the immune system. Now, the details of this trial were examined uh, just a, a, a year or two ago um, in an extraordinary NOVA special called Judgment Day, pardon me, Intelligent Design on Trial. Many of you may have seen this show, but if you didn't, Here's the trailer from the program. It will give you not only an idea as to what this show was like, but also what the people in Dover went through during this process. Oh, no. I believe there is an intelligent design in the beginning. God created. If you don't believe in evolution, it's only saying we don't believe that the Civil War ever took place in the United States. An extraordinary court case ignites a small town. Like a Civil War within the Question. And put science itself on trial. Very important things were at stake. One is the future of science education in this country. Nova reveals the story behind the headlines. Anywhere you turn, we were getting attacked. Witnesses um, started dropping like flies. It posed the question Is intelligent design a scientific alternative to evolution? Probably the subject of a science class or religion in disguise. It's a violation of everything we need and everything we understand by science. Judgment Day, Intelligent Design on Trial on NOVA. Now, now, I hope the narration was dramatic enough for you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I discovered after the fact that that's what TV people refer to as the end of the world style of narration. But this was an amazing show. It won a number of awards, including the Peabody Award for Excellence in Broadcast Journalism, sort of journalism's equivalent of the Oscar. Uh, it was just an amazing program. You can still watch it online in streaming video. And I would urge you to do it, because it really not only 
goes through the scientific and the legal issues, it goes through the personal issues that really divided this small town in Pennsylvania. Now, most of us who participated on the winning side in this trial um, suddenly discovered that everybody was calling us up to do interviews. And uh, we were interviewed in Science Friday, CNN, the Today program, all sorts of other stuff. But I probably got the most interesting interview requests at all. Of all, I ended up on a talk show known to many of you as the Colbert <laughs> Report. And I was tempted, and I really mean this, I was sorely tempted today right now to play a tape of my interview on the Colbert Report, but I resisted that temptation, knowing, knowing of course I was at an Augustinian University and resisting temptation is what you should be doing. <laughs> but um, for those of you who would like to see it, all you have to do is to Google my name and Colbert Report and it will come right up. And I had such a good time on that show with Stephen, and he had a good time too that when my new book came out last year, Stephen actually called me up and said, now that you have a new book, I have an excuse to have you on again. Would you like to come on one more time? And then I ended up on the Colbert Report a second time. Now, I know there's a number of high-ranking university administrators here and people really concerned about the state of higher education in America. As a result of this, I have, you know, I'm sorry to tell you this, I have a very sad and depressing message. And when you think about this, this is really disturbing. And here it is. Nothing I have ever done in my entire scientific or professional career has ever gained for me the degree of respect with my students of being on the Colbert Report. <laughs> and when you think about it, that's actually pretty depressing, but that's, that's essentially the way things go. Now, what I haven't told you is what happened in this case. Just before Christmas in 2005, the decision was announced, and this conservative judge said intelligent design is simply not science. It's a religious idea masquerading as science. This was reported in newspapers around the country. It was reported on every single one of the network news broadcasts that night, and it set off all sorts of rejoicing and jubilation in the town of Dover. And believe it or not, people involved in the trial have had annual celebrations to remember this, and two weeks ago, we had our last one in downtown Harrisburg, a concert for Darwin, and I had the pleasure of being there and hanging out with the plaintiffs, the attorneys, the other expert witnesses, and other people. It was a blast. Now, I would love to say that as a result of this decision, we won, it's over. The other side had all the time they wanted, three full weeks, to lay out their case, and they simply fell flat. But the reality is, it's not over. And that, quite frankly, is why I wrote that book, which was published last year. The battle isn't finished. It's not actually about evolution. It's really an attack on the entire core of scientific reason. And that's an important thing to appreciate. And finally, I think it matters. It really matters for this country's future. Because if we raise up an entire generation of young people who have been taught as a result of these, these conflicts to be hostile, and suspicious and mistrustful of science, we are going to sign away world scientific leadership. And I think that'd be a terrible thing for this country, and I think it'd be a terrible thing for the world. Now, despite its scientific failures, intelligent design, as you all know, is still a public relations success story. This is one of these slides you're never supposed to show to an audience like this, because there's too much data and you can't even read it. But what you see up here is the results of surveys of about 1,000 people in each of 33 advanced countries asking them basically, do you accept evolution or not? And if you said yes, you're in blue. If you said no, you're in red. If you weren't sure, you're in the color in between. Iceland and I think Denmark were right on top. Now, in case you can't find the United States in the chart, because the print is too fine, I'm going to help you out. We are right there. We are next to the bottom. The only country we beat was Turkey. Now, uh, I have to tell you something about that, because it, it brings something to mind. We have, in my graduate program at Brown, in molecular and cellular biology, we have two Turkish graduate students. These are great guys. They came from the best university in Turkey. They're close to finishing their PhD. They're going to make great scientists. Um, and as I was reading this article, one of them was walking down the hallway. And I said, Batur, you've got to come in here and you've got to take a look at this. And I showed him the article. When he got to the last page and he saw that chart, he put his face in his hands and he said, I am so ashamed. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, look at that chart. We couldn't even beat the United States. <laughs> Interesting, and, a danger, and, and something that tells you something, I think, unfortunate about the state of science in our country. 
Now, now, why is this? And I think there are really a lot of reasons. But I think in the public imagination, intelligent design creationism um, survives because it seems to fill a vacuum. And that vacuum is formed by any fossil or structure or process that hasn't yet been fully explained by science, hasn't yet been fully explained by evolution. And of course, on the day that the biological sciences fully explain everything, researchers like me and other people here at Villanova are simply going to be out of work. Um, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. It's one of the things that makes science so exciting is that there are so many unanswered questions. But that's part of it, because you can always plug this idea into anything that we in science have not yet figured out. But I think just as significant is that this vacuum can be made to feel threatening by the idea that evolution is hostile to the values that are held by most Americans. Now, what do I mean by evolution being hostile to values? Go on the web, type in evolution and creationism and stuff like that. Um, you're going to find graphics like this that you can download and print out. Look at that. Don't teach our kids they come from apes. And you can see what apes allegedly do. You see a knife there and so forth. Um, the, um, I, I, anyone who's ever studied the habits of chimpanzees and gorillas know that they, they rarely use knives. Um, <laughs> And in most cases, they certainly aren't murderous. But this idea that evolution tells us something terrible about ourselves is, is, is everywhere in the literature and certainly on the internet. Look, look at what we have here. We have uh, from a creationist website, a little boy writing, life is an accident. There are no absolutes. Life has no meaning. People are animals. There is no God. What is the result of little Johnny learning these lessons? It's in the right-hand panel. He takes a gun to class and he shoots somebody down. Now the notion that killings in the schoolyard are the direct result of being taught evolution is not a fringe phenomenon. This is actually part of the website of the largest anti-evolution organization in the United States, the one in the upper left hand corner, Answers in Genesis. These are the guys who opened the $27 million Creation Museum in northern Kentucky. And after a schoolyard shooting two years ago, this was the front of their website. If you don't matter to God, you don't matter to anyone, why are people killing each other in schools? We reap the consequences of the unquestioned acceptance of the belief in evolution every day. It's their biology lessons that are dehumanizing students to the point of making them murderous. Now, as a scientist, when I speak to scientific groups, um, I often point out that popular magazines have actually called this the evolution war, the evolution wars. And I ask them, how do we win the evolution wars? And I think there are two easy answers. One is focus on the scientific evidence for evolution, which is overwhelming. And then the second thing is by stressing the distinction between science and belief. Science and belief are not contradictory. They can be complementary in many ways. But I think the heart of this, and this is what I wanted to stress in the second part of my talk today, is that there is, in fact, something that makes many people uneasy about the process of evolution. And here you can see a billboard that appeared last year in Kansas, um, sort of ridiculing the idea of evolution. Um, the kind of classic anti-evolution propaganda you'll see in many places in this country. But I think the real issue isn't just anti-evolution propaganda. It's a competing, and for many people, a compelling story of human origins. Now, what is that competing and compelling story? The answer is, of course, it is the story of creation. Not just the biblical story, but the general idea that you and I were put here for a purpose, that this world belongs to us, and our lives have meaning and value. In a secular sense, there are equivalents to this. So I'll put Genesis in the background for a moment, and I'll bring up a little poem that probably a lot of you have read. Um, you'll find you can buy little plaques in places like that. People hang in their living rooms. It's called Desiderata. And in this poem, part of it says this, and I think this is really a, a compelling message. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt, the universe is unfolding as it should. And again, I'm going to highlight that one sentence. You have a right to be here. There's something deeply comforting about the thought that you and I are meant to exist, that this world is meant for us, and that we are the center of things. But as you all know, 
1859, another story emerged about the origins of species and particularly the origin of our own species. And that other story was in a book called The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, which was published 150 years ago yesterday for the very first time. This is an extraordinary book. And for many people, it broke that central position that humans have. It no longer made it possible for us to think we had a right to be here. It, in effect, pushed us off of center stage. Or at least that's what many people thought. Darwin, when he wrote this book, he anticipated that. He thought, you know, people are going to react this way. And he tried to anticipate that criticism. And I want to show you part of what he wrote. These are his words in the very first edition of that book. He said, to my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the creator that the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes like those determining the birth and death of the individual. And he continued, when I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Cambrian system was deposited, they seem to me to become ennobled. Ennobled, what a remarkable word. You don't see this much in the 21st century, but in the 19th century, it conveyed a kind of reverence for life that I think was part and parcel of the argument that Darwin wanted to make. Now, how did this other story emerge? Where did it really come from? It came from straightforward, obvious observations of the world around him. Darwin was interested in horticulture, in plants, vegetables, flowers, all sorts of stuff. He was interested in animal husbandry. So take, for example, the two pictures I've put up here with some very common vegetables on the left-hand side, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli. I'm sure the favorites of most of the students here. And on the right-hand side, uh, a little sprig of wild mustard. How are these things related? Well, Darwin knew this. And what Darwin knew is that every single one of these vegetables that you and I probably think of as completely individual and separate plants actually emerged from that ancestral wild mustard. And human cultivation, growing for a larger fruit or a smaller fruit or more leaves and so forth, selective, uh, 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 basically artificial selection, had produced every single one of these individual vegetables. So Darwin was impressed by the fact that the raw material of nature has so much variation that you can select for things that almost look as though they are distinct and different species. Not true just with plants, but also with animals. Darwin was a pi pigeon fancier, like a lot of Brits. And he realized that the common pigeon that you found all over Britain had, in fact, been bred using its existing variation into dozens of varieties that look so different from each other that if we saw them in the wild, we would think that they were separate species. And he began to think, and this is when he was still a very young man, could it be that species are not fixed but are subject to some sort of change over time? Well, when he was still a young man, just after graduating from Cambridge, Darwin stepped on board a ship called the HMS Beagle. And in that ship, he traveled around the world in a voyage of almost five years. And one of the things that impressed him were animals that he had never seen before. Now, this guy was a Brit. Until he went on the Beagle, he'd never been off the British Isles. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen, picked up, or touched an armadillo. But the first time I saw an armadillo, I was just, I'd never, whoa, what kind of animal is this? And when you actually touch them, very, very strange. Well, Darwin saw these guys, and it just blew him away. Nothing like this Europe, just dazzled him. But what dazzled him more was when he started to participate in excavations. He discovered that there were fossil-like organisms, also not found anywhere in Europe, known as glyptodonts. And glyptodonts were clearly armadillo-like fossils, even though they were quite different from present-day armadillos. And one of the things that Darwin wonders is, now this is weird, why should these two animals, which look very much like each other, both of them be found only, to his knowledge at the time, in South America? Very strange that the extinct animal that looks most like the present-day animal is found in exactly the same continent. Is there a relationship between them? And then he went on and found other examples. Darwin himself found this large skeleton called mylodon of a giant ground sloth. He also realized that there were present-day living creatures in Central and South America like the two and three-toed modern sloth like this. And once again, 
That is the extinct relative of the animal that looks most like it, and they're in the same place. And in a book published 20 years before the origin of the species, it's called The Voyage of the Beagle, he speculated. And here's what Darwin wrote. This wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living will, I do not doubt, throw more light on the appearance of organic beings on our Earth and their disappearance from it than any other class of facts. You can almost see him getting to the idea of what today we call descent with modification. Now, a little story. He wasn't the only naturalist bombing around the world trying to figure this sort of stuff out. One of the other people who did this was Henry Walter Bates. Um, what I'm gonna, the story I'm going to tell you right now was told in Sean B. Carroll's wonderful book, Into the Jungle, Great Adventures in the Search for Evolution. Bates spent a total of 11 years collecting species in the Amazon basin in South America. During those 11 years, he discovered 14,712 species. This means, if you do the math here, that if today Dr. Bates discovered only three new species, it would have been a slow day. So in other words, he was discovering more than that per day. Just amazing. Um, greater than 8,000 of these were new to science. He published his results in a book called The Naturalist on the River Amazons, as it was called at the time. And Bates actually brought along with him, for the first four years of his trip, a young British naturalist, not from a wealthy family like Darwin, but from a working class family. That's why he can only stay there for four years. His name was Alfred Russell Wallace. And Wallace got exposed to the sorts of things that Bates was working on. What sorts of things? I'll show you one of them that they both studied. Um, they discovered about 550 species of butterflies. And at first, they thought they be all belonged to a genus named Leptalis. You can see it right here. But when they looked at these butterflies a little bit more closely, what they discovered is only some of them were Leptalis. Other ones um, in local areas including a included a genus named Methomia, um, another one called Mercantus, and another one called Methona. So the interesting thing is that the Leptalis genus, which has spread all over these three different areas, in each of the area, somehow it had managed to change its appearance so it looked like the dominant local species. And Bates and, as it turns out, Wallace wondered, why should Leptalis, this one genus, vary in a way that mimics other butterflies in its own region? And Bates' explanation was this was a way of gaining protection from predators by having the pr predator confuse you with the other species that might be poisonous or might have a, some other sort of defense mechanism. Here's what Bates wrote. According, therefore, to the closeness of its persecution, I love 19th century biologists, persecution by enemies who seek the imitator but avoid the imitated, will its tendency to become an exact counterfeit, the less perfect degrees of resemblance being eliminated generation after generation, and only the others left to propagate their kind. It's remarkably close to natural selection. When his book was actually published, it got a review in one of the transactional journals of the British Philosophical Society. Here's what the reviewer said. It is the best work of natural history travels ever published in England. Your style to me seems admirable. It is a grand book. And whether or not it sells quickly, it will last. Um, you always wonder, um, who, who's the reviewer? Who would write something like that? Well, the reviewer was this young guy who just got off the Beagle. Namely, that was a review by Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin himself, of course, had been on his own voyage of discovery. He returned from his voyage in the Beagle in 1836. He wrote out a draft of his idea of th species formation in 1844. He didn't have the courage to publish it, but he actually set money aside and gave it to his wife and said, if I die early, you take this money and you publish this, because this is an important idea. Um, and as it turns out, the essence of his theory was very simple, and it was very close to what you just heard Bates say. A kind of process called natural selection operated all the time in nature, and natural selection could be the driving force behind the origin of species. So he worked and worked and worked, but for 15 years published nothing. Then, in 1857, Darwin got a letter. Now, unfortunately, the letter has been lost to history. But just so it would look a little more complete, I put another letter up here, um, actually, written, actually written by the same person. So it's the same handwriting. And who was the person who wrote this letter to Darwin? It was that young naturalist 
um, who had gone along with Bates in his journey in South America. It was Alfred Russell Wallace. Very well, well, either, so it wouldn't be very good in the water. It turns out they haven't said that for about 15 years. And the reason they haven't said that is when paleontologists begin to dig up fossils that look exactly like the organism that they said couldn't possibly have existed, they had not anything to say. And the organism you see here, which plugs right into the middle of this, it's an almost perfect intermediate form, has the wonderful Latin name of Ambulocetus natans. And those of you who have taken Latin, you know exactly what I just said. Ambulocetus is the walking whale, and natans is who swims. This was an intermediate form and a perfect one. But here's the cool part. Once it was discovered where this guy was found, in the Indus River Valley between India and Pakistan, other paleontologists showed up for a look as well. And guess what? They found a second species, also intermediate in this area. Then a third, and as it turns out, a total of six intermediate forms are now understood between these land mammals and their cetacean descendants. Now, I actually swiped this image from a wonderful book by Carl Zimmer, a science writer. And I was very careful when I gave a talk in New Haven, Connecticut last year to attribute it to Carl, because he lives near New Haven and I thought he might show up. And he'd be steamed if I didn't mention that it came from his book. And sure enough, he was there. And he caught me afterwards and said, I'm glad you gave me credit for that. I said, you're welcome, Carl. Uh, but then he said, but I have to tell you, there's a mistake in the diagram. And I was kind of bummed out. I said, oh, man, what did I do now? He said, you said there were six in here. Uh uh, that's out of date. There turn out to be 21. Um, that, is, that is how dramatically, that is how dramatically the fossil record of cetacean evolution has expanded. In fact, Hans Tewissen, who discovered some of these key fossils, he's a paleontologist from Ohio, actually wrote an article called Whale Origins as the Poster Children for Macroevolution. And indeed they are. We understand this very well. Um, now there's a former a uh, student from Brown who's now a professor in the area at Swarthmore College. His name is Colin Parrington. And even more so than me, Colin is a real wise guy. And after my testimony in the Dover trial, Colin actually called me up and said, Ken, I read your testimony. It's good, but it's much too verbose. Um, you shouldn't have spent a day and a half on the stand. You should have ended it all with one sentence. And I said, Colin, one sentence? He says, yeah, it's one sentence. And it's so simple, I can put it on a bumper sticker and I'll mail it to you. Two days later, I open the mail. Here's the bumper sticker. We have the fossils. We win. And it's three of these yolk protein genes that are found in birds. They're called VIT1, VIT2, VIT3. How do we understand why they're there? There's only one way to explain them, and that is our evolutionary ancestry. But it gets even better than that. Because as it turns out, VIT1 and VIT3 were lost first in the entire line leading to mammals. VIT2 hung on later. And as it turns out, VIT2 is the one yolk protein gene that works in monotremes, egg-laying mammals like the platypus. Uh, there are two non-functional remnants right there. And here's the other cool part. Based on DNA sequence changes, the loss of the yolk protein genes paralleled the appearance of the milk protein genes and the evolution of the placenta. In short, it's a developmental story that fits the molecular story brilliantly. There's an even clearer example of our ancestry to be found in human chromosome numbers. We humans have 46 chromosomes. All the other primates, without all the other great apes without exception, have 48. Why, if we share a common ancestor with these guys, that common ancestor had 48, how can we possibly have two fewer? Is it possible, and all the biology students in here know those 46 chromosomes are actually two sets of 23. How could we have gone from 24 sets to 23? Could we have just lost a pair of chromosomes? Not possible. The loss of both members of a homologous pair of chromosomes would be fatal. Fatal to you and me, fatal to a chimp, everything. The only possibility is that what must have happened is the two chromosomes that are still separate in the other primates must have gotten accidentally stuck together to form a single chromosome in us. That would have dropped us from 24 pairs down to 23. So that's the explanation that is consistent with evolutionary common ancestry. But here's why evolution is science. That's a testable explanation. If that really happened, somewhere in the human genome, we contain a recently fused chromosome. And if it's not there, this whole idea of evolution by common ancestry is in trouble. Now, how would we find, pardon me, how would we find a chromosome like that? Easier than you think. I've sketched two chromosomes up here. The tips of every human chromosome have a chromosome has a highly repetitive DNA sequence in it called a telomere. That's in blue. 
Near the center is an equally special region called the centromere. That's in red. If one of our chromosomes was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes, you know what it should look like? It should have telomere DNA in the center, and it should have two centromeres. It should be really easy to pick up. Do we have a chromosome like that? The answer is, you bet we do. It's called chromosome number two. The chromosome number two has every mark that I've just mentioned should be there as evidence of human common ancestry with the other great apes. It's clear, it's straightforward, it's incontrovertible. But scientific evidence is only part of the story. The other part is a kind of religious fear of evolution itself. And this was summarized very nicely by your former senator in Pennsylvania, Rick Santorum, in an interview that he gave a couple of years ago. He said evolution has huge consequences for society. It's where we come from. Does man have a purpose? Is there a purpose to our lives? Or are we just know, you know, the result of chance? If we're simply a mistake of nature, that puts a different moral demand on us. In fact, it doesn't put a moral demand on us that if, in fact, we are a creation of a being that has moral demands. That's a powerful statement. And I want to focus in on what Santorum said about evolution saying we are a mistake of nature. Is evolution really driven by mistakes? A lot of biologists would say yes, because we think that mutations provide the raw material for evolution, and mutations are mistakes. But my biochemistry prof, when I was an undergrad, said, if you think this is a mistake, imagine an organism that's perfect that never makes a mistake. If it never makes a mistake, it never has a mutation. Is that a good thing? Well, if you have no mutations, you can have no adaptations to new conditions in the environment. You'll have no evolution. And you know what will happen over a few years? You won't survive. Therefore, maybe this business of making mistakes is wrong. Mistake is the wrong word. Maybe evolution isn't a mistake of nature. Maybe it's an essential element of nature itself. And I think that's exactly the right way to look at evolution. To me, there's a key insight here. And that is the claim that evolution is this chance and random process, meaning anything can happen, for many people is at the heart of objections to what they call Darwinism. But I want to tell you today that evolution isn't random. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's start off this way. We live in a material, and by the way, this is one, one of the few things that Madonna consistently gets right. We live in a material world. Um, the capacity for life is literally built into the physics and chemistry of matter. So evolution is an inherent and predictable property of nature. It's not a mistake. Evolutionary processes are creative. They explore adaptive space, and in doing that, they're driven by natural selection, which is not a random process, and by natural law, which is not random either. Now, I'm going to skip this slide because it requires some explanation, but some leading cell and developmental biologists basically agree with exactly what I've just said. What this means is an evolutionary design to life really is part of the inherent fabric of the natural world. And I would argue, therefore, that the emergence of a living world, very much like the one we live in, isn't some random accident. It's an outcome that is made possible, maybe even inevitable, by the fabric of nature itself. And again, I'm not the only person to feel that way. The paleontologist Simon Conway Morris from Cambridge University has argued exactly the same thing, that human life or something like it is inevitable in the universe in which we live, given the constraints of nature. Now, what does all of this mean? I think there are several ways to look at it. And I would say to religious people, the fruitfulness of the evolutionary process can be understood as a reflection of what they might call divine creativity and promise. To non-religious people, there's none of that, and evolution is just a property of nature itself. But either way, the study of that nature is exactly the same. And I would say that ultimately, this is why science is compatible with faith. Now, many people might say, yeah, but there are a lot of scientists who say that, that science is not compatible with faith. Most famously, Richard Dawkins, who's written extensive galaxies, and each of them have about 100 million stars in each of them. To me, this doesn't look like a bleak universe. This looks like a universe that is bursting with evolutionary possibilities of the very sort that we have on this planet. So I wonder if one might look at this very same science and say the following. And that is, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect from the wisdom of a provident and purposeful God intent upon a fruitful and dynamic world and committed to a promise of freedom that makes genuine love possible. 
Now, my, a lot of my scientific colleagues would say, that doesn't sound very scientific, Ken. And I would say, that's right. That's not a scientific statement. But do you know what? Dawkins' statement wasn't scientific either. It was a philosophical statement that he thinks was informed by science. And that's pretty much what mine is as well. And I think that's the essential point here, which is that science can be understood by people of faith in ways exactly like this. Now, I'm not the only flaky scientist to feel that way. Probably the greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century, in fact, for sure, was Theodosius Dobzhansky. Dobzhansky very famously wrote, every biology teacher knows this, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And he was absolutely right. But in the very same article, look at what he wrote. The diversity of life is reasonable and understandable if the creator made the living world not by caprice, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. It is wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive. I, Dobzhansky, the scientist, am a creationist and an evolutionist. Why? Because evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation is not something that happened 4,000 years ago. It is a process that began 10 billion years ago and is still underway today. Do mainstream religious leaders feel that way? Here's what Pope Benedict said when he was asked about evolution two years ago by a group of journalists. He said, the contrast between creation and evolution is absurd because there are many scientific tests in favor of evolution which appears as a reality that we must see and which enriches our understanding of life and being. Now, I know that's a complex statement, but you know, if you want things boiled down for you, do what I always do. Go to the, go to the New York Post. What does the New York Post do? They always summarize things well. God and evolution do mix Pope. <laughs> now, now lastly, um, does this mean that the Bible should be read as a scientific textbook? The answer is of course not. But I want to let you know that I'm not the first person to say that. St. Augustine, writing at the beginning of the fifth century, said exactly the same thing. Now you can read this yourself, and I'm going to translate it on the fly into what I think is 21st century English. And look at what he's telling people. Even a non-believer can study geology, astronomy, zoology, botany, and other sciences, and can gain scientific knowledge from observation and experiment. Now, the worst thing that could happen would be for a non-believer to hear a Christian presumably explaining the Bible, talking nonsense on these scientific topics. We Christians have to do everything we can to prevent the embarrassment of non-believers showing up scientific ignorance in a Christian and ridiculing it. That's Augustine telling you don't read scripture as science. He's not worried about Charles Darwin. He's worried about an understanding of scripture. Are modern scientific ideas like the Big Bang, are they compatible with a faith that's based in scripture? I often like to challenge students by asking them, who came up with the idea of the Big Bang? Was it this Einstein guy? It turns out it wasn't Einstein. It was the guy you see standing next to him right there. His name was Father Georges Lomatre. He was trained in mathematics and physics. There's a wonderful biography of him called The Day Without Yesterday. And Father Lomatre was the person who demonstrated to Einstein that general relativity requires an expanding universe. And ultimately, Father Lomatre was right. One of the great fundamental discoveries of 20th century physics was, in fact, made by him. And he was often asked by people, but you're a priest. Doesn't the Big Bang contradict the Bible? Here's what Father Lamatre said. The writers of the Bible were illuminated more or less on salvation, but on other questions, they were just as smart or just as dumb as everybody else in their generation. Hence, it is utterly unimportant if errors of historic and scientific fact are found in the Bible, especially if errors relate to events that were not directly observed by those who wrote about them. And Genesis certainly falls under that idea. He continued, because they were right in the doctrine of immortality and salvation, they also have to be right on all other subjects. It's simply a fallacy of people who have an incomplete understanding of why the Bible was given to us at all. And indeed, I think that's true. I was challenged by a scientific colleague once after I read that Augustine quote. He said, what kind of weird science would we get if we followed the prescriptions of some bizarre mystic like Augustine? And I thought, oh, I know how to answer that question. I want to answer it with the life of a person who was so taken by the thought of St. Augustine 
that he joined a religious order founded according to Augustinian thoughts. This is a picture of the guy. This is probably the one audience in the world where I can't get away with hoping most of the audience doesn't know who that is. Um, he was considered a deeply religious person. He became the abbot of the Augustinian monastery of St. Thomas in Brunn in what is today the Czech Republic. And at one point in his life, he got interested in what today we would call a scientific question. How did he solve the question? Did he read scripture? Of course he read scripture. Did he pray? Of course, he prayed every day. But to answer the scientific question, he went into the garden and he did experiments. As you all know, the name of that Augustinian priest was Father Gregor Mendel, the founder of the modern science of genetics. What kind of science do you get when you follow Augustinian precepts? You get genetics. And I think, I think that is as profound a statement as anyone can make about the ultimate compatibility of science and religion. I thought the person who put it best, ironically, was a very conservative writer for the Washington Post, himself not a Christian, but a person of faith, named Charles Krauthammer. And after the Dover trial, he wrote a column, and you can see the message up here, phony theory, false conflict, intelligent design foolishly pits evolution against faith. And Krauthammer wrote, this is why he's a columnist, he knows how to turn a phrase. How ridiculous to make evolution the enemy of God. What could be more elegant, more simple, more brilliant, more economical, more creative, indeed more divine than a planet with millions of life forms, distinct and yet interactive, all ultimately derived from accumulated variations in a single double-stranded molecule, pliable and fecund enough to give us mollusks and mice, Newton and Einstein, even if it also gave us the Kansas Board of Education. <laughs> and I think that puts it very well. And finally, I have to tell you that I am often asked by people, what do you think about evolution? Don't you find it depressing to think that you're just an animal or you're descended from ancestors who crawled up out of the slime? And I let that sink in for a minute. I always say, no, I don't think so. I, I find it astonishing and remarkable to think that you and I are united, not just with each other, but with every other living thing on this planet in a fabric of life that has mastered the conditions of this planet and has given rise to everything we see in the living world, ourselves included. That's the way I put it. But I think the way that somebody put it 150 years ago was even better. He said, I don't find this depressing or demeaning or demoralizing. He said, on the contrary. I think there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. That's the concluding sentence of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And ladies and gentlemen, I think those are words to live by. Thank you very much.